Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not so sure if this is working yet, but uh, first I would like to welcome you to the Catalan School of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, the ICN2. My name is Jose Garrido, and apart from the researcher, that, which is my main function, I'm also the vice director of the Institute. And I would like to welcome you all to this event uh, uh, of the SOMA Alliance on Gender Equality. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. So a big crowd, I think, for for the times where we are. And let me see if I can start this. Yes. Now I just need to click here and see if I if it's working. Yeah, well, so in case that you don't know uh, the Institute, I would just like to do a like very brief introduction and then I will leave you with the second part of the event. So, um, well, you know, you're here, but also the ones who are look, uh, watching us from, from abroad, the Institute is in the Bella Terra campus of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. This is an area which is a cluster on, on nanotechnology, microelectronics, uh, microfabrication, and apart from the Institute, from the ICN2, we have all the other centers, uh, um, also Severo Chua, like IGMAP, and we are um, collaborating very closely with uh, Alba Synchrotron, Spanish Center for Microelectronics, and of course, the Autonomous of Barcelona. Um, a couple of words about our history and also the relation to the, to the Severo Choa. Uh, we are not a very old center. Um, yeah, a bit of, the, of our history. Um, it is not a very old center, uh, and it comes from the merging of two different centers, one from the Generalitat and one from CSIC. And it was in 2013 where we have a fully merged uh, uh, center, which it was now the Institute, the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And soon after, uh, one year after, we were very lucky to have the first uh, Severo Cho Award. And it was for uh, four years. And during these four years, we managed the full integration of uh, some of our researchers where we're coming from to SIC, now part of the, of the ICN2. In 2018, when we finished our we were finishing our first Severo Choa. We got uh, the, the second Severo Choa Award uh, that has brought us until, until today. Um, we have participated uh, in the Alliance. Uh, and we are very happy that you are, uh, that we also participate in this uh, gender, uh, uh, in this type of event. We just finished our uh, Severo Choa application and we, we hope that uh, it will be successful. We will see. Um, summer is going to be a very exciting time. Um, for, I mean, a couple of words so that you understand the type of center we are. Uh, the main mission of our center is to mostly explore frontiers of knowledge uh, of phenomena that happens at the nanoscale. Apart, apart from this type of like a fundamental um, um, mission or understanding is we want to generate and create value for society. And this creation of value can be in the form of knowledge, uh, and also in the form of collaborations, cl close collaboration with industry. Recently, we had another uh, aspect to our mission that was to inspire and, 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 and train a new generation of scientists. Uh, we are not a, a university, but uh, we are a center and we think that it also should be also part of our mission as a research center to generate, uh, to create like a new, new, a new generation of scientists. The goals uh, for this type of, uh, of, I mean, to achieve this type, by, uh, this type of mission are very clear. So we want to focus on fundamental understanding, fundamental science, but with that science, uh, we also are very much interested in developing uh, impact. And this is in the form of uh, creation of devices, uh, applications, developing new techniques for exploring, uh, for exploring the nanoscale. And uh, with all of that knowledge, um, big part of, our, of the center it's to uh, offer opportunities to industry. At the, at the end, the industry is also part of our society. We focus on being a nanotechnology, nanoscience center. We are very multidisciplinary and we focus on, um, we do, do not focus so much on one single sector, but there are different sectors like ICT, health, and energy and environment. Um, we are a center we, of, re I mean, of research, uh, embedded in a society and fostering dialogue with society is key in order to um, convince society that uh, centers like ours should exist and that the governments need to invest in, in this type of, uh, in this type of, um, uh, of centers. And finally, as I said, uh, we, would, uh, we are preparing and nurturing talent uh, at different career levels, not only at the 
uh, researchers uh, or PhDs, uh, postdocs, but also beyond that, and not only for science, but uh, for uh, the team supporting the supporting science. Um, for the science that we do, it's very general. As I said, it's multidisciplinary uh, research center. So we cover uh, aspects on electronics, on quantum technologies, uh, energy uh, harvesting, energy storage, and for instance, also the use of nanomaterials in, in medicine and, and in health. No? Um, the numbers, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, we are of the order of 280, uh, 180 uh, members in the Institute, uh, 60 percent around is uh, for female, 80% um, of, of, uh, of the members, uh, I mean, of, of, of people at the Institute are, are researchers and only 20% is part of the admin of research support. Um, the operating fund uh, changes between 12 and 14 million per year. And 60% uh, of that it's coming from their coming from competitive funding um, and only uh, below or above 35 percent comes from our from our patrons as i said uh, we just finished our uh, new severe show application i just want to before concluding i want to mention that uh, uh, we are very excited for this uh, we focus on, on nano solution for a sustainable society um, days like this so like uh, so warm and uh, so hot you realize how relevant it is to have a sustainable society and we do believe that science and in particular nanotechnology and nanoscience can have a big impact no? in areas like, uh, well, developing like energy efficient, uh, efficient uh, information processing um, or sustainable energy technologies. And of course, uh, 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 nano solutions also for, for medicine. So with this, I would like just to conclude uh, again, welcome you all to this uh, event of the, of the SOMA Alliance on, on gender Equality. It's a pleasure to have you here to host uh, this event. I really hope that uh, we all will have a, a wonderful event. And I'm going to give, uh, leave you in the hands of uh, Neus Bastus, that uh, in addition to a researcher and a colleague, she's also the chair of the um, uh, Equal Opportunities Committee of the ICN2. Thank you very much. Have a very good one, uh, wonderful event. And, and well, I'll see you around. Buenos dias a todas, todos. Uh, thank you to, to be here. Thank you to share with us this, uh, this day. And uh, my name is Neus Bastuz. I'm the chair of the Equal Opportunity Committee in science and technology and engineering. And this is something that applies uh, very, very deep in our uh, institute. We are an institute of science and technology. We are an institute of material science in which uh, some part of us, we are physics, chemists, and uh, also engineers, and, and uh, in, in this direction, the, the, uh, the opportunities that women we have at the ICN2, they need to be taken with care, and uh, the ICN2, the direction, and the committee is, commitment, is committed to the implementation of uh, policies and equal opportunities plans to intend to give visibility to the work that we women we do and we historically did, and also to foster new vocations, a new generation of scientists that they grow up with a different background than the one that, 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 we, that, uh, that we live. So the Equal Opportunity Committee was officially launched in uh, October 2014. Nowadays, the Equal Opportunity Committee at ICN2 is composed by Julio Gomez, Alex Arjami, Nuria Benitez, uh, you know her very well, uh, Josep Nogues, myself, and Belen Ballesteros. So we are a group of uh, people coming from management administrative department, but also scientists and technical staff. And we want to, to uh, extend this, uh, this committee to up to 12 members in the following one, two months. So we have all of, uh, all of the news involving uh, females, uh, women, uh, women at the ICN2, and also the news that are important uh, to emphasize. For instance, you have uh, the third event on gender equality of the SOM Alliance, and then also the last, uh, the last uh, new from the physique where uh, 16 ICM members who were uh, ranked among the top uh, 5,000 scientific female researchers. So the other important, a very important action of the, of the, of the committee is the Women Talent Program. The Women Talent Program, uh, it's a, uh, it's, uh, 
it's a prize, it's, a, it's an event which aims to award the best female PhD thesis, the best published paper, the best published paper for a PhD and a postdoc, and, uh, and two uh, prizes, so two grants, one uh, for the postdoc at the postdoc level and the other one at the senior level. Uh, just a, a little bit, the, the Women Talent Project in numbers. So we, uh, we make two calls of projects with, uh, we evaluate 24 proposals and four they were granted. Uh, for the publications, there were three calls for the best uh, uh, PhD, uh, best paper published by a PhD and a postdoc, with 76 papers uh, evaluated and seven awards. And for the thesis, we had three calls with 57 theses uh, evaluated and four awards. Additionally, beyond the woman talent uh, program, so we are making emphasis in in all of the all of the activities uh, or around the International Women and Girls uh, in Science, so the 8th of February and, and also the 11th of March. The other action that, uh, that uh, we consider, and, and I think it is, uh, it's a very interesting action, is the le leadership seminars, in which uh, the, what, what, uh, what the committee did is, uh, is to, uh, to invite women who, led, uh, who are leaders in different fields, not only science, but also uh, Karma Ruska Dieda, she's a, she's a cooker, she's a well-known cooker. Also Maria Blasco, you know her very well. And uh, Monica Terribas also is a journalist. And with uh, this idea of uh, making inspiring, so how they live, they work, and how, how, what can we learn from what uh, they did and what they understand uh, the role of females in, in their respective uh, areas. Finally, I, I want to also to show you a little bit the, the work that has been done in the human resources area uh, for uh, the training of, uh, of the science of the future. This is uh, very important to foster new scientists. Also the ICN2, it has a, a institutional procedure for the prevention, the detection and the treatment of the harassment situation. We also participate with our centers as BIST or with our, uh, yeah, as BIST. Uh, in mentoring programs and, and programs to the mother of science. And finally, the ICN2 has also a mentoring program that we can discuss, or there will be some uh, roundtables today to discuss a little bit the role of the mentoring in, in, in this. No more delays, I just want to, to show you again the agenda. So what we aim to do today, uh, first of all, is going to be a talk by Jakob uh, Felfos Christensen, I hope you, <laughs> okay, on the gender and diversity dimension in research projects. And then there will be three parallel discussions, you know it very well. One is going to be from effective communication of gender plans and actions. The other one is using gender plans to effectively improve gender equality. And finally, one uh, on the mentoring programs. So just, uh, I, I want to thank you again very, very much to be here. I think it's going to be very interesting for all of us, especially for us to share with you and to have, we have because we have a lot of common points to discuss and it's a very nice way uh, to meet together in person, finally, after a pandemic. <laughs> so, and uh, just again, thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much to Nuria because she's the person who make it possible. So I just want to, uh, Congratulate and thank Nuria and all of you for your, for your attention. I can put it in the program because it was full enough, but uh, we will, uh, Jacob's uh, session will last uh, one hour and a half. Then we have a coffee break to ref. I, I'm not sure if we will refresh because it will be outside, but we will have some refreshments. And um, afterwards, every um, discussion table will last around 50 minutes because we need to move from different uh, floors. But uh, uh, it was expected to last uh, one hour uh, each one. So from um, one hour and 15 and uh, to two hours, we will have a lunch break too, also in the same place where uh, we will be taking the, the coffee that is turning this corridor and going to the right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, uh, my name is uh, Jakob uh, Felfos Christensen, uh, and I run, uh, I'm the director of a Diverse Unity, uh, a small consultancy based in Denmark. And I work, have worked in research management for 10 years or so. Um, 
uh, mainly pre-war, but also with internationalization. And then a couple of years ago, ago I decided to uh, start this company and work with um, diversity and internationalization in research and research management. And a free business advice from me to you before we get started, don't start an international consultancy two months before the outbreak of a pandemic. That's bad timing. Um, just do with that what you want. Um, but today I'll be talking about, about gender and diversity dimensions in research projects, as the headline said. And uh, when I got the invitation, I immediately said yes. And then uh, right afterwards, as I was, I think it was like 10 minutes, 10 seconds later, I was like, oh God, what did I say yes to? Uh, how is it exactly it's going to look that we will be having a they will be having a gender summit and then the uh, white man will stand in front of all the women and tell them how to write about gender in projects uh, that's not going to look good uh, but exactly i do actually think there is a point to this uh, because what is it exactly we talk about when we talk about gender and uh, and research because what we're really talking about is women uh, and the moment we talk about women, it's mainly women who can talk about it. And we can see it in the room here today, it's mainly women. But that's not only when we talk about gender, it's main, when we talk about diversity, if, it's a, if people can sign up, we will see that 90% of the participants are women. It's only when it's a mandatory thing, like they are, if it's a cohort of junior researchers that we're doing some training for, then, of course, everybody has to show up. But if it's volunteering, no matter what, it's mainly women who show up. And I think that is a problem. Um, but we also made it uh, part of it that only women can talk about it. And as I, we can do see the same in other groups, when we talk about race, it specifically becomes about Black people talking as a gay man. Uh, I can say when we talk about LGBT rights, it's LGBT persons who can talk about this. And it is becoming a bit of a problem that we, nobody can, we can only talk about our own group and we have to open this up. So I'm taking a chance here and even as a, uh, as a man trying to talk about gender, but I will broadening it out a bit. And exactly what is it we're trying to fix when we talk about gender and writing about it in applications, because it has a tendency, I think it's becoming better, but particularly in the beginning, there was a... a, a dimension of we're trying to fix the women. Why can't they just bloody fit in to this system that we have created? Why do they have to be so annoying? And as a gay man, I partly understand it. Um, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But hopefully we're becoming, we're getting, having more of a structural approach by now. And we'll talk about some of these uh, uh, things. And the other problem, of course, is why we're still talking about this, particularly when it comes to gender. We've been talking about this for 50 years and, it, the, and the dialogue hasn't really changed. The problems are absolutely the, the same uh, as they used to be uh, 40, 50 years ago. They have improved a bit, uh, no doubt about it, but the, the discussion is still the same. Now I'll get back to that uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, why I think that is uh, so. But when we talk about diversity, it's of course much more than gender. And we'll, uh, it's gender, ethnicity, race, social class, sexual orientation, age, religion, physical ability, neurodiversity, cultural background, and many, many more. Um, I should perhaps just say, I'm happy to share the slides. You're of, take all the photos you want to, if you want to, but I'm happy to share them afterwards. Absolutely no problem. Um, um, and we will get back to this because it is, it is important to take into account that we have all these things, both now, now but particularly in the future, I think it's going to be important we, uh, that we think about this. It's not only a question of being allowed to be yourself, but about having a dignity, acknowledging a background and giving space to make your contributions heard, much of what we heard that you're already doing uh, here. And these last things are very important when it comes to, when it comes to writing about this, this is in applications or projects generally. We're building a community and we're improving the sense of belonging to enhance the commitment and performance. And it shows uh, that universities maintain their relevance in a fast changing world and increases the societal impact through fostering social cohesion and attracting the most talented researchers. Because strangely enough, the main talent isn't always white heterosexual uh, uh, men. It, it would appear so, <laughs> looking, looking back, 
but it isn't, and we have to do something about the culture. And it is important in research, it's not, we just don't want to be good, and it isn't just all political correctness and uh, woke ideology, I think, is, is the, the new uh, word for all of this. The domestic analysis has shown that, uh, more, uh, that research papers from more ethnically mixed groups will, have, uh, will be more likely in, to be in higher impact journals and gain 5 to 10% more citations. That's leaving the whole discussion about bibliometrics. We'll put a pin in that for the moment. Uh, but the increasing nature of global re uh, challenges, threats, and research, let's just look at the weather today. Supporting, uh, um, we can see that we are looking at societal challenges and international collaborations is the new interdisciplinarity. We are working uh, globally for now. I'll be focusing on European collaborations, but that difficult enough as it is. And the moment we make it international, gender and diversity isn't getting any easier. Uh, and if societal challenge is more a buzzword, then we have to do something about it. And one of the things that we talked about when uh, we talked about doing this was where, how do we write about gender and diversity in research projects where there isn't an obvious um, uh, gender dimension? And one of the things I think it's important to write about this and do this anyway is that the presence of someone from a different group, identity group makes the others generate more ideas and con construct more complex arguments because we're very aware that they are different and we think they won't understand us. The just the presence of someone different is, is so incredibly important for us to develop new ideas, but also how we explain them. And uh, I'll get back uh, to this uh, later on as, uh, as well. And if we look at the Horizon Europe program guide, I think there's a, this is copied directly from there. The highlights are mine, but uh, the text itself is, is from, from, the, from the program guide. Intersectionality describes overlapping or inter uh, intersecting categories such as gender, ethnicity, racial origin, age, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, and geographic location that compound to determine the identities and experience of individuals. Researchers and innovators should not consider gender in isolation. Gender identities, norms, and relations both shape and are shared by other uh, social attributes. And that's this is all right now in Horizon. I mean, if we look back at Horizon Europe, you could basically get away with murder. You could just write, oh, we know the gender balance is the consortium isn't really good, but we promise to do something about it, blah, blah, blah. You can have this paragraph and you could copy paste it from uh, application to application and that would, it would not be a problem. Now we have the gender equality plans, that's a bit better, but basically it became the box ticking exercise that we, everybody, Hoped it wouldn't be, but I think this sets a uh, sends a signal for where we're going. Next time we have a program in seven years, it won't be as easy as that, and we it won't only be about gender. So we get a better get prepared, and we better get better at writing about this and incorporating in how we do uh, research projects. Some of the things that we, talk, that we talk about and gender and diversity isn't relevant here. And we can, um, and some of these uh, examples are, are very, very well known, but uh, humor me. Uh, in medicine, it's very known that we have, uh, uh, we will uh, have uh, new drugs tested on students. And, we're, and these are, of course, in Western European universities, what are the students, they're white young men who sign up for this. And we test medicine that is for diseases who mainly hit uh, black women in the US. Why? But nobody thought about this when they tested it. Also, we know very little about how a uh, heart attack affects women because most uh, research on heart disease is done on men. On the other hand, we have basically no clue how osteoporosis affects men because it's, the research is always done on women. Um, AI, you mentioned AI in, in the presentation, how I work with that. It's one of the most uh, common examples where there have been significant problems with recognizing other fa facial recognition for anybody else than white uh, uh, men. 
uh, there has been a strong racial bias, a strong gender bias, uh, and particularly we talk about uh, gender also, gender non-conforming uh, persons, uh, the AI has difficulties um, uh, recognizing. And it's not because these are homophobic, misogynistic, racists uh, doing this research. No, it was just they thought it was math and coding. There's absolutely no gender dimension to this. We're just doing math to, to, to make this work. And they forgot all about it. And why did they do that? Because everybody in the room was, was white and male. When you look at down here, it's, that, I, I didn't know how to illustrate this. That's supposed to be a big data and a gay dimension to this. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the thing is, when we look about data, we collect a lot of data. A lot of it we're not allowed to collect and for good reasons. Um, but when we look at, for let's say, um, identities, LGBT identities, they have done some, uh, they recently had a census in Scotland where they ask about this. And when you're particularly to talk about gay identities, if you ask people if they identify as a gay or lesbian, you will have approximately somewhere around 2.5 percentage of the population saying yes. If you ask people about this, but who they have sex with, then it's the number is 70% higher. If you ask people who they are attracted to, it's twice as much. So how we ask this question will really determine whether it's 2.5 or 5% of the population. Uh, and the problem of course is, that's one thing, and in a sense that it makes sense, should we make rules, should we make laws around this, how big part of the population is this, this would be relevant in research as well. But it's also, but now because it's so politicized, it can easily make it be a problem. Because if the part of the population that is gay is bigger, then suddenly they will say, oh, they are grooming children. The grooming children, the population growing, we have to say, do something about this. But if the, if the number falls, then it's not relevant to do something about, um, about the uh, gay rights. And suddenly, if you're not aware of this, and you're collecting all this data, and you're doing open, uh, open science, you're putting the data out there for everybody else to, to use, if you're not aware of this, suddenly you have, you have been, probably been creating uh, unintentionally a big problem for the gay population. Uh, snow clearing. This is a very good, uh, uh, a good story. I think a lot of you uh, know it. Uh, it's uh, from Sweden, Karlskoga, uh, and uh, Sweden is uh, are doing very well when it comes to, to gender. I think one of the most progressive countries in the world. And there was a times a few years ago where every municipality should look about that all the services and see if there was a gender dimension to it. And uh, there was about a lot of work around there. And then in Karlskoga, one uh, person joked, well, at least we'll have the snow clearing to ourselves. Uh, there's no gender dimension there. And he should never have said that. Uh, uh, because it turned out, as said, everywhere else, what did they do when there was a lot of snow? They cleared all the big roads uh, so that the cars could get to work. And who drives the cars? Who, uh, men. Men, men do the main uh, part of that, and they go to work. The problem, of course, is that who, have, who leaves early? It's women because they have to drop off the kids and run a, a number of errands on, on the road. And where do they travel? They travel on bikes and on pavements. And that was the things that were clear the latest. So actually, it turned out that there was a very clear gender dimension to this. And it could easily be joked about as a political correctness, but it turned out to be a very good business as well, uh, as well, because when they started clearing the pavements and the bike roads first, and then the big roads uh, at the end, the business had, uh, it didn't lose as much money because the women were always late for work uh, because of the snow. Now they could be there on time, but also where, does all, where do all the accidents happen uh, due to snow and ice, people on bikes and walking? 
So the number of accidents due to snow uh, uh, fell by 40%. So it actually, there was absolutely no cost to it, but there was a lot of economic gain to something that had absolutely no gender dimension. For the guide to reviews in, uh, in Horizon Europe, uh, here are a, a bit of uh, some other examples that they refer to. Why do we observe differences between women and men in, in infection levels and mortality rates in COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, car safety is one of the uh, uh, classic examples. Seat belts were designed for men uh, and basically killing women in, uh, in uh, car accidents. Uh, um, uh, mobility uh, analysis of transport planning. We always pl plan it so that the sub from the suburbs into the city where all the workplaces, the roads and uh, public transportation is there. The problem, of course, is that women do the shopping and put, give, uh, take kids to school and kindergarten, et cetera. Et cetera. They have to go uh, across and there are absolutely no roads and there's certainly no public uh, transportation doing like this because we always think people have to go into work and back and people do, or the men do at least. And then did you know that pheromones give, given off by uh, men experiences, but not women, induce a stress response in laboratory mice sufficient to trigger pain relief. And then of course there is, did you know that climate change is affecting sex determination in a number of marine species and that certain populations are now at risk of extinction. I say the last two I didn't know, but I have a background in the humanity, so I think <laughs> I'm excused for that. But I do think that a lot of these things we just don't think about that this could actually be uh, uh, important and can affect something that we don't uh, take into account. And this also shows us just that the reviewers are asked to look at this much more than they were before. Now they don't just look at the composition of the... Um, uh, of the, of the um, consortium. So some of this happens because of the mere exposure effect. This is, there's more to it than that, but the, a, a simple version is that the problem is that our brain rewards us with a warm feeling when we are in familiar surroundings. So the more we're exposed to something, the better we like it. And the, that means that's why we recruit people who are like ourselves. It's just a lot easier. It's not that because people are particularly evil, um, or some are probably, but most people, most people are not. Let's, let's assume they're not evil to begin with, at least. Uh, but it's just a lot easier for us. It's a lot easier if, if everything is familiar and it's just, oh, we like that. And so we tend to forget it and we have to expose to something new a lot of times before we, um, we, bef before we uh, begin to, uh, to like it. I'm not particularly happy with this slide, I'm, the look of it. I've redesigned it a number of times and then, uh, yeah, it is what it is. The thing is that what makes this uh, so difficult for, uh, for us compared to the, uh, to the, sea, uh, the biology of, of uh, the sea animals is norms and culture. Because I'm, I'm here and now when you're, you're, when you're all, uh, chatting uh, around in Spanish, I become very aware that I'm Danish. Um, usually when I'm at home and on the couch with my husband, I don't think about being Danish that much. Uh, um, but those are some of the things that as an individual, there are a lot of uh, things to us. We're part of a family culture and the other groups we, we work, we're part of a workplace. We're, and that is... Uh, Workplace has institutional policies and strategies. We're also part of a state, and there are some federal laws uh, surrounding all of this. And there's a national culture, and there's a global culture. It's a fairly easy for me to, uh, I don't think a lot about being gay traveling here compared to if I was traveling to Saudi Arabia. Um, and it's a lot easier for me to come here uh, as, um, because it's in Europe, I can travel freely. The culture isn't that different. So it's fairly easy compared to if I had to go to China. So there are all these things that um, forms us. And in the end, it changes depending on the context. And that's what we think. And the problem is that we often think of culture as some essence. 
like there is some Danish essence in me or a gay essence in me or wherever it might be. But in the end, culture, culture is something we do and culture is something we do together, depending on the context. And we tend to forget that. And particularly, I think we tend to forget that in academia because we have this idea that there is one academic culture. Academia is the same and that's just BS. And the, the, as long as we keep that pretense up, we will continue to have uh, difficulties. And I would say a lot of the international projects we see, I would say they are not collaborative projects. They are silos working in parallel. And that's not the idea of Horizon Europe. But it's just to say, all of these things we bring with us in every encounter we have, and we have to consider, take that into consideration when we do this. Another problem we have is project similarity. So when we believe that we have more in common with people from other cultures, and we actually have, and this often leads to misunderstanding. And I said, particularly in academia, because we pretend that uh, there is one academic culture. Um, when I worked in the research support office, I'll say, we spend a lot of time on, on budgets. Jesus, all the time I spend on making budgets. Uh, but I have never seen a pro an application that wasn't submitted because the budget wasn't good enough, but I've seen plenty of application that wasn't submitted because people didn't communicate. They've had absolutely no idea of culture and everything blew up uh, 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 in, uh, well before the uh, application deadline. So when we're working with this and we're in the application process, there are two important questions. And what am, I not, what am I not seeing and who can help me see it? The problem is that we want to, we particularly I think it's a problem for the PI because they are so responsible. And I think they have the, uh, this idea that they have to be able to answer everything themselves. And you don't, of course not. That's the whole idea of this. Uh, uh, if everybody could uh, see everything, we could uh, continue to leave all the research to the white, white straight men. But, but, but that's not how it works. So it's important to answer this and who can help me see it. And if you can't answer those two questions, I think there's perhaps an even more important question. And that is, if I can't, should I do this research? And I don't think we, we ask that question often enough. I think we tend to look at the topic of the research and do I match this? But all these other things surrounding gender and um, am I seeing a broad enough perspective? We tend to forget that. And if it doesn't fit how we think, we pretend it's not there. But I think that more researchers should actually ask these questions and then think, if I don't, if I'm not able to say this, perhaps I'm not the one to do the research. We made this uh, uh, model and I'm happy to share that as well. If you want to uh, afterwards, it's not very good on, on the slide. Um, where we try to walk through the whole idea of uh, diversity in research proposals. And uh, because uh, there are a number of places you can put, uh, put this in. A lot of this would be around uh, the consortium and the culture of the consortium. Because my, I don't think what, what we often want in this is like we could do in Horizon Europe, we can basically have a, this paragraph about gender diversity in, 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 in research and then we can copy paste it. We want that nice easy solution so we can focus on what's really important, the research. Um, but that's not what it, how, how it works. And I think that a lot of these things we can't necessarily answer beforehand, but we can create a culture and we can create a, consor a diverse consortium. And in this uh, culture, we can make it possible for these very diverse people to ask all the right questions so that we get these dimensions as we go along, because a lot of them, we won't be able to see them beforehand, but they can show up if we allow people to ask the right questions as we move along in the research project. 
the first we call forming the uh, forming base. So what are uh, what is the aim and dimensions, and how can diversity can contribute to to the aim of the project? And what are the most important dimensions of diversities? Now, the European Commission has made it very clear that the main dimension is always gender, and I think that considering. Uh, the, uh, that it's 50-50 globally, that's probably true. Uh, so there should, uh, unless uh, said otherwise, we should always have a gender dimension. But as we said, gender is never in a vacuum. You're always something else as well. Uh, and so we should consider it in an, in an intersectional context. What does a funder say about diversity? And then one had, do we have of internal research resources? Now we heard about the, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, research, internal resources you have here, and, uh, and most of you will have some sort of resources. Some of them are perhaps mainly on paper, but, but still there are some things to, to, to work on. We have, then we call the building blocks there, the next uh, slides, so I'll get back to that in, 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 in just a second. And then, of course, how will you monitor and evaluate diversity during the project? Because if you're not monitoring or evaluating like you are everything else, then it's empty words. And I don't care then. And the evaluators will see right through it. Then you have the application form. And I'll get back to the standard Horizon Europe application form uh, later on. And then there are ethics. And I actually think ethics is one of the places where you can make a huge difference if you want to here and you can use it in your work because ethics easily becomes this uh, um, box ticking exercise no i'm not going to put needles into children no i'm not going to kill the animals and yes we will do it according to the helsinki declaration blah 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 and it's like five minutes before we hit submit we we we, we do all that if we actually look at it and I think it's, it's incredibly unambitious because it's mainly the do no harm and do no harm is, is really good. But what if you can flip the ethics section and say, what about we didn't just do no harm? What if we could actually do something good? What if you could see all these potential challenges that are with, let's say, collecting uh, data on a specific group and they can get into problems or we uh, might be hurting someone or we're not uh, aware of uh, uh, this and this. What if we just said that and took that problem and said, why, how could we actually make it better for these people? Then suddenly we have this ethics section that's not just ticking boxes and let's get over that and back to what really matters, the, uh, the excellence part of the application. And we could actually improve that section by actually taking ethics seriously and not just tick boxes. And I think there's a big potential there for most, uh, for most researchers and a way to find some of those diversity dimensions that you, when you sit down and look at the projects, you think they are not there. I think if we started with, if you look at the ethics section, they are there. The implementation, how will you do it in your strategy? And then the future work, how will this benefit and the lessons learned from the working with diversity in your project? How can you build on that in, in the future? Some of the things we've, uh, we, we've uh, worked with, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to share this. The method, partners and collaborations. Do we have the right partners network and credibility in these networks? Again, if you don't, are you the right person to do this? I, I don't think you are. You can build that. But if you haven't, you should work on it. When you look at the recruitment, uh, luckily, we've, there's been a lot of work on recruitment, seeing how a lot of the wording in advertisement for jobs actually uh, often attracts men more than, men, than uh, uh, women. It's done a lot of work on tenure tracks, how you can make that more uh, attractive to, and accessible for, for, for women talent development are you training your, your your junior researchers and probably some of the senior researchers as well but particularly probably the it's easier to to call it training when it's junior researchers um 
Are you training these, them to, to navigate the, how the world is changing? Are you giving them the right skills to move, a, uh, move ahead and become leaders uh, in research in, in a more diverse future? Um, are you taking travel advice? Everybody can't go everywhere and be safe. Are you, are you aware of that? Uh, we've seen some horrible uh, examples, particularly in the UK, where, it, and it's because the business model of universities in the UK are, are different. It's more business and not as much a public as here. So a lot of them have satellites uh, overseas, uh, uh, both uh, Shanghai, China, but also parts of the Middle East. And we have seen how they have basically, some of them have tried to force uh, openly gay researchers back into the closet and go to the Middle East and teach in countries where it was uh, where they weren't allowed to be uh, open about the sexuality, which of course is uh, illegal. An employer can't do that. But that's how determined some universities are to make this worse and are so unaware of what um, happened. And if you don't talk about this, uh, sometimes people don't know and they forget. There was another example where a there was a consortia and one of the partners with the King Abdullah University of uh, Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And they had a consortium meeting there and they're talking about, they're having a dinner. It's all very good. One of the participants from uh, Western Europe is gay, but is not saying anything. But one of the other members starts referring to uh, the person's partner, same sex partner in the middle of this, making it incredibly uh, awkward but also putting that person in danger. Unaware, if we don't talk about this, then suddenly you can put one of your colleagues in danger. And that's why it's so important that we talk about some of these things and also take something as simple as travel into advice, when, uh, into account when we uh, work with these things. Conference hosting, conference participation, can everybody, are you taking, making uh, childcare possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in your strategy, and we'll get back a bit back to research strategy uh, in, a, in a minute or so. It's one of the things uh, that you could, to put it a bit earlier in the process, allyship, are you showing allyship to, to people, uh, to, to, the, uh, to minority groups? Meetings, what is a meeting? What we don't often think about is that the idea of a meeting is something that is very bound in national culture. Some, yeah, sure. Yeah. Have you got the approval or measure to just play? Because I'm thinking what that's like just to play we have some of the ideas about it, and I can certainly show you some uh, show you some links to some few some of the universities who have, uh, uh, yeah, uh, mostly when they came because they came into trouble about it. <laughs> they, they developed it later on, but but yeah, some some uh, some uh, some universities have. Yeah, is that for good? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, meetings. What, what is a meeting and how do you do it? In some cultures, a meeting is somewhere where the boss shows up and tells you what has been decided. In some cultures, it's, some, it's a place where things are discussed. And then we reach a, a, a conclusion together. But how we reach that conclusion is also very different. You can have a, very, a, a culture where you discuss very openly and you fight about it and you shout and yell. And you can have a very consensus-oriented culture like Dan Danish culture or even more Sweden, where you just, you, everybody just says what they think. And then you slowly, and if you're not part of the culture, nobody can understand it. Foreigners in meetings in Denmark, they are baffled. They think that nobody reached a conclusion ever. <laughs> but we reach conclusions slowly, like moving forward, and then everybody's just in agreement, and they're, what, 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 what just happened here? And it's one of those things, and when you put a consortia together with, let's say, from 10 different countries, and they have recruited people from, let's say, a total of 30 countries, we have 30 different ideas of what a meeting is. And if we don't discuss it before, 
we have the kickoff meeting uh, when we get the funding. Then we suddenly have the parallel silos because nobody understands what has been agreed upon uh, at any time. Who makes the decisions? Is it the boss? Do we make it in uh, uh, together? How about hierarchies? Who speaks? Is it always a professor who speaks first? Can a, a new PhD speak um, uh, their opinion as a first person when a question is asked? And then, of course, there are a lot of communications uh, in this as well. I'm not going to walk through all of that. How do we get feedback? Differs remarkably uh, between cultures. How do we have social events? How do they include everybody? How about publications? Are you consider, uh, uh, considering the diverse scope of your project? Are you publishing in the right journals? Are you where people are actually seeing it? Outreach activities. Very good to have an article in a newspaper, but if this is, this is actually somewhere that the people who need to know this read. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll tell you, you can have all these questions if you want to. Um, yeah, and you can see how I'm checking my time, because uh, the moment you uh, get to Scandinavia and Germany, we are so aware of time. We're, I mean... And you will definitely come to other uh, uh, cultures where time is more of a, an estimate. A time, a time plan is like, yeah, we'll see. My husband, if we're going to dinner somewhere, if we don't have an exact time for where we're supposed to be there, I mean, it, it will kill him. He can't just say, yeah, we'll be there six, seven, something. But yeah, but when? <laughs> is it six or seven? And if I, I make the mistake of saying we should probably there, uh, be there at six, if he can see that we will be five minutes late, we should call them. We should probably call them now and say that we're running it. I think they can handle it. I'm pretty sure that they can handle it. But it's just to show that how different our idea of, of time can, can, can be. So I'm checking my time uh, because it's just a Scandinavian in Mimi who's a bit neurotic about, uh, about time. So one of the things that, we, that happens here is that although we may think that a major obstacle conducting businesses, business around the world is in understanding foreigners, the greater difficulty involves becoming aware of our own cultural conditioning. And I think that is so incredibly important because we, we think everything we do is normal. We forget that what all the others do, they think that's normal as well. And that's perfectly okay. <laughs> they, they are not absolutely mad just because they don't stick to time and are there at, at five to six when we agreed to it. It's actually okay. And it's okay to have meetings in a different way. It is okay to have it, but we have to be able to talk about, and we have to bear, be mainly be aware of our own blind sides. And that comes to gender and diversity as well. So I'll just take a bit of a step back here and say, because we could actually probably solve, or we could solve some of these things a bit earlier. Because when we look, about, look at research strategies, what we tend to do is we will talk about structures. Do we have the uh, training? Do we have the facilities? Do we need some new uh, machines? How about the timing? When there's a deadline for this? What are we going to apply for when? And we'll apply for this uh, now and then in three years and then publish two articles. And then in four years, I'm ready to apply for that ERC that will secure my career. What are the ideas? Uh, that I want to look into and how do I get there? What we completely forgot to talk about in, in most research strategies is the people. We never talk about people. But most of us do need a team and we need to do this in collaboration, but we rarely talk about um, the people that are involved in this. These are just three, we have a whole thing on, on research strategy, but these are, we try to make a, a few questions for some different parts, of, some for the researchers, some for the department, and some for the research group. When you're developing a research strategy, some questions that you can actually ask yourself about 
people, the training you have? Do we have the right networks? Uh, do we have the right network of research partners, impact partners? Are we showing allyship? If not, if we just come and, and try to do that five minutes before we submit up an application, will they, will they take us seriously? Probably not. Uh, what else? Yeah, who's making the decision on a research strategy for the department? Is that a diverse group or is it just the, the same old, same old? Um, and it's a research group representative of society and people that our research has impact on. So there are a number of questions here that yeah, I'm, I'm happy to leave you with that I think that we could answer earlier on and that could solve the pro some of the problems when we are sitting there with the application form in front of us thinking, bloody hell, what am I going to write about gender? And how the thing we want to, to, to how we want to manage it is a few things here is that the definition of diversity management uh, that we use is of working strategically towards new development and resource through creating and managing teams of different competences, perspectives, and personalities, because you can't have it all in one person. We don't just want diversity for the sake of diversity. There's a risk that we see people as a stereotype and reduce them to one thing. We should be aware of culture, but if we focus on culture all the time, we see nothing but culture and it becomes insufferable. Culture becomes your destiny. And that's a bit of the problem when giving a presentation like this, because I think this is important. I think it's incredibly important and I think we do more with it. And, but I also aware it's not everything. And we shouldn't just look at person based on their, on their gender, on their sexuality, on their race, on their religion, whatever it might be. We should also look at that. Because the moment we only look at them as a PhD degree, that's not a lot better. Then we were still reducing them to one thing. It's just another thing. It's a thing we like in academia, but we're still reducing them to one thing. And then your planning sets the scene for more than itself. And there is no such thing as a neutral strategy or rational planning. And I think that's what most people pretend when we do this thing. I think that's the main reason that we haven't moved ahead on this. Is we <coughs> pretend that particularly in academia, we are rational beings. We, it's all about the science. We don't all want all that thing to interfere with what's, what we're here for. We are just here for the science and we forget that, is, that actually science doesn't appear in a vacuum. Science is done by human beings for human beings. And the moment we pretend that we, have, we are closing our eyes for reality. So let's make it more, uh, a bit more uh, specific and look into the Horizon Europe forms. Just, I won't go into detail, but it's just to show that there are a number of places where you look into uh, that you, this is uh, important. But if you look at the role of participating organizations in the project, there are a number of roles here. I think there's like 12 or 13 roles described. One of them is research performer. I think most of us would think that's the only role there is. <laughs> But actually, there are a number of them, and they, they, you could find the diversity somewhere else. Then there is, of course, the gender equality plan, and I could have a whole rant about this. I actually wrote a whole rant about that. It will be in research professional in a couple of weeks or so. But still, one of the good things about the gender equality plans is it does, it does indicate a structural approach. It did so, try to go beyond the uh, uh, generic paragraphs. But is that the case in the uh, research group? Because paper is grateful. The main, the main thing you do in gender equality plans is to, have, to collect all the paper you have on gender equality and put it in one place on the internet. It says that uh, that should follow resources. But one thing is what the institution says has this moved down into the research group. And then there's a budget. Does your budget and acknowledge that different groups have different needs? And then back to the ethics and security, move beyond do no harm and legality. Uh, can you flip it and do good? And how does international collaborations challenge you in this, uh, in this area? Because they will. In a lot of things, uh, a lot of dimensions, it will differ uh, significantly. 
And we looked into part B, and that's, of course, where it gets uh, interesting for, for, for most of us. If you look at the excellence part, appropriate consideration of gender dimension in research and innovation content. This is the general form. If you look to some of the forms for particularly uh, uh, the Marie Curie program, you will see that a lot of places where it just says uh, gender dimensions, there it actually says gender and diversity dimensions. It doesn't say it's in the standard, but if you look to some of the other programs, it is more specific that it's not only gender, but diversity. So be aware of that. And then, and this is of course what we really want to, to write about and where we have all the challenges and all the problems. I think sometimes when we don't think there is an, a gender dimension, perhaps it would be easier if we move down to the impact section where it requires us to write a narrative explaining how the project's results are expected to make a difference in terms of impact beyond the immediate scope and duration of the project. Because here, that would definitely be a direct uh, diversity that I mentioned, and perhaps it was easier to sit, to start here and then move back to that instead. It's just we really like to write about write the excellence part, because uh, as researchers, that's what you know, and that's what you're comfortable with. But starting here could perhaps help you up there, because it asks you to be specific, referring to the effects of your project, and not research and innovation in general, general in this field and state target groups that would benefit. Note how they uh, not how they also want the potential negative impact on the scientific community, end users, financial actors, and public at large. The public at large tends to be quite diverse. <laughs> so the moment we start here, you might, might actually help you hear yourself to work, uh, to do the work up there. Then as of course the methodology, uh, what are the concepts, models, and assumptions? And even if we don't have a, let's say, very clear gender and diversity dimension, having all these people together that are diverse will create different models. So everybody is, if everybody's the same, we think the same, we think the concepts we have in our heads are the same, and we create models. The more diverse a group you have, the, they will have different ideas of what a model should look like. And then the chance is that you will have a model that everybody outside your little research group will actually understand. If you have an SSH dimension in this, and most topics have now, believe me, there will be gender and diversity uh, there. And uh, then of course, the, the data uh, you uh, collect and how it's used, particularly in this day of open science, there is a lot of potential of data also being misused here uh, because some of these uh, areas are so politicized today. And then of course, there is in the implementation, the list of critical risks uh, and description of the consortium. I hope that consortium is very diverse. Uh, and of course, the critical risks will differ significantly from group to group. You won't hit it all but you can hit some of them. And I think moving across these lists and comparing them a bit can help you write these sections uh, better. Because as you can see, it's a lot of places. There isn't one generic paragraph that you can take and copy paste from one application to the next. It's also, when you look back at the guide for reviewers, took some of the examples that show how they want you, the reviewers to think about this. But it's also uh, important to know that in case of identical scores, if the third point is, if necessary, the gender balance uh, among the person named in the proposal who will be primarily responsible for carrying out the research and or innovation activities and who are included in the researchers table in the proposal will be used as a factor for priori prioritization. So it's very, it, it's very easy to see now that if you do, it was a bit like that in Horizon Europe as well, uh, as well but uh, uh, oh, Horizon 2020, <laughs> but it, it's become more evident, uh, evident here. And I think as competition grows more and more fierce, you, we have several topics now where you will have uh, more two or three or more uh, proposals 
reaching 15 points and they are moving down and sometimes they're moving down to 0.3, 4, 5 uh, before they decide uh, who gets funded. So you better get it uh, all right. This is mainly, I don't know if everybody's a researcher or who's research managers, but uh, if you're a research manager, these are questions that can help. If you're a researcher and the PI, be a bit schizophrenic and ask yourself these, uh, these questions. But these are some of the things based on what I've said. And again, you can have the slide and, and, and use this, these questions all you want. Some of the main points that you could ask the PI also, if you're a participant in, in developing this proposal, have um, you can run through. I'm not going to run through them all because you've heard it all by now, uh, what I've, uh, what I've uh, said. But it is a bit of a, a, a checklist or a help to, to run through uh, some of these uh, things. Then finally, I'll try and, and do a bit of a Because often you will see that gender diversity in, in academia is, is described as a wicked problem. But I'm, I'm not so sure. Because I think it's more that it's gender and diversity is stress testing the system. Because when we look at all the things that makes it difficult, it is the bibliometrics and how we use that even when we know that there is a clear gender dimension to this. There are all sorts of problems with bibliometrics, yet we keep on using it as a main way of uh, measuring excellence. Excellence, speaking of that, we've defined that very narrowly. It is academic excellence, scientific excellence, but very rarely compared to, uh, very rarely with an impact dimension. And we don't, and you can have how many? No, I'm not going to do that. That's because that will be embarrassing. But with in a larger audience, we will have we've done this a couple of times, and we would ask how many have seen an a PI being continue to apply for funding, being the PI of Lord's Consortia, when everybody knows that he's because it's mainly a he, isn't it? He's a complete dick. And we continue to do so. And why do we do that? Why do universities continue to do that when we, we see PhD students uh, uh, not completing their PhDs, leaving, uh, other people leaving, everything? So, you see, he has good bibliometrics. He's an excellent researcher. And that's what is needed. We don't really care if he's a good leader because he has what we want. The moment we start talking about these things, about gender and diversity, there will, always, there will be someone in the crowds screaming about academic freedom, and we're trying to limit them in, in some way or the other. There is all the data, and data comes in two ways. Both it's a problem uh, uh, because we have all this data, all this data, and we're so focused on data. And when it comes to gender and diversity, a lot of data is not uh, allowed to be collected. And so we say, oh, but we don't know how we don't know how big the problem is. We can't collect the data, so we can't do anything about it. Well, you know it's there, particularly if you're allowed to use qualitative data. And one of the recurring uh, things that we see when you read of, uh, when you read about gender and see, but there are there isn't a problem. No, but, but, but because particularly when it comes to gender, a lot of the problems are never referred because women don't believe things would be done. There would be done anything about that. That goes to harassment, rape, all kinds of problems in society and public. Uh, and the Me Too uh, movement has definitely shown in Denmark that there were problems uh, in academia as well. And what was the solution? If there was a solution, uh, uh, most of the times it would be to move the woman to another department. So she has to kickstart her career in a new department and it had absolutely no consequences for the man who did the harassment. Sometimes it was even rape. 
there was a few uh, examples of rape, and this was the solution. When we are doing ourselves a, 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 a disservice here, and we're not in exactly encouraging people to uh, report things, and then we don't have the data and we can close our eyes. And then, of course, most universities, now you, here, you're a fairly small research institution compared to large co comprehensive universities <laughs> no offense but that could be actually be to your advantage it's a huge machinery to to get working and one part doesn't know what the other part is but when we look at all this and see what makes it a, a wicked problem the one thing that is in common in all these parts is universities so i'm not so sure that gender and diversity is a wicked problem some I think that universities are the wicked problem. And sometimes I'm not so sure it's as wicked as we want it to be. So I think some of these things, we know it very well and we could solve it if we wanted to. So this is about a bit about me, where you can find us, both Diversity Unity. We also have a podcast, the Diversity and Research Podcast. When we talk all things gender and uh, gender diversity, internationalization, and you can find it everywhere you listen to podcasts, uh, and it's uh, absolutely free. Uh, and we have a lot of a uh, lot of uh, fun talking about the Chinese spies and being uh, transgender in uh, STEM and uh, all all these uh, these things um, that relates to this because it's incredibly complex. Of course, it is, uh, um, but. I promise I would leave about half an hour or something for, for questions. So I'm uh, supposed to wrap up. And I think I'll wrap up with a small story because it easily becomes about research strategy and uh, Horizon Europe and uh, all these uh, complex matters. But what is, and sometimes we forget a bit what it's really about. And uh, so a, a, a small story. Uh, when I worked in the research support office, um, I, uh, one of the great things was the annual Christmas party. Uh, I love me a party and I, I love to dance. I don't dance very well, well but I dance a lot. Um, <laughs> and of course, when you, when you're at these, uh, these, uh, uh, parties, when you go out dancing, what makes dancing funny is that there's an element of flirtation in it. That's what really makes it fun. The only problem, of course, is that as a gay man, I want to flirt with boys. And you don't do that. You dance with the girls. And I, I dance with girls and I have fun and it's, it's, it's not a problem as such. But still, it's not the same. And sometimes I would be, probably after a, a, a gin and tonic or two, I would be grab one of my male clothes and say, come, let's go dancing. And nobody ever said no or anything. They were, it was all fine. But what really made the change was that year when one of my male colleagues came to me and said, you want to dance? Because then he had figured out that it wasn't just about me trying to fit in. And it wasn't about me doing all the work to change the system. It was actually the system and him being part of the system that had to change for me, and I've never been bullied, I've never been harassed for being gay. I'd probably be a few situations I would call microaggressions uh, during the years, but I've never experienced, ever experienced any problems. But this, this was the first time I felt normal. And this is what it's all about. We want everybody to feel normal. And we have to remember that at the end of the day. Thank you. We have a micro and has it, so just raise your hands. Perfect. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. Uh, I would start from the end when you said the system sometimes has to change yeah. so you fit normal. And we see from the audience that mainly all the audience are females. Yeah. And I am wondering how the uh, gender group that feels the most oppressed in academia is the one who is seeking the change. Mm. But the 
the others who have uh, mainly the authority are not here and mm. they are not trying to help us to fit in the system. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, if I could solve that problem, I would be in a much better paid position. <laughs> <Good evening. laughs> I, I think, think there's two, two, two things, things to it. it. I think one is privilege, privilege blindness. A lot of would a lot of the people not here would insist that there is an equal system, and they all, and some of them more or less know that they are lying to themselves. But I think that there, there is there is a, 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 a blindness to it, so they don't think it's relevant. Also, they, there will be a lot of people who would say, well, it isn't my problem to solve, which is wrong. At the end of the day, I think the main reason is that most people are scared to talk about these things because it's difficult. It's really difficult uh, to hear about people being oppressed to some, in some way, being uncomfortable, being harassed, being bullied. Uh, uh, sometimes out of academia. And then it's a lot easier not to show up. And sometimes I think the first, we tend to produce a lot of paper around these things, policies, strategies, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not against that. I'm, not, I'm just not sure that the world needs more policies to stand on a, in a, be put in a drawer and never be used. I think what we mo the place to start is often to have to help develop a shared language. And that's difficult. And it is difficult when you are part of the oppressor because as we have seen both with Me Too, but also when it comes to a lot of other things, it has been a lot of minority problems have become so politicized that people are so scared of saying or doing something wrong. And then it's just better to do nothing. But it's, our motto is at least, it's better to do something wrong than do nothing as long as you're willing to apologize. I wish, I wish there was a simple solution to it, but I think sometimes we need to get more hands on and have things like this, but also in other situations, uh, let's say in consortium meetings, et cetera, and perhaps start with some of the easier stuff like international culture. When we work with research groups and uh, often European grants and they have we sometimes come to a kickoff meeting and have them talk to some of the international other set dimensions of, let's say, yeah, meetings, hierarchies, all these things, and help develop a shared culture. And then when you start developing a shared language, you can move into some of these more uh, troublesome um, um, uh, areas like gender and diversity. Sometimes it's easier to start, it's better to start an easier place and then move there. And it's because sometimes we just want to tackle it head on and want to create the, this policy that will solve it all. And that policy doesn't exist because at the end of the day, it has to work people to people, person to person in face-to-face -face meetings. And then we need to develop skills and we need to develop language and it takes time and it's difficult. I should never be sales, should I? <laughs> That's a horrible sales speak. Um, may I add something? Sure. Because uh, we are mainly uh, um, equal opportunities or whatever committees in our institute. And, uh, you know, most of us, uh, we really volunteer for this <laughs> because this is not our main job, our no. main uh, position, but uh, we like uh, volunteer for that and we are like selected mm. for different reasons. And how can we fit these committees, these um, decision-making mm -hmm. uh, roles with people from, with diverse people mm. without, uh, you know, um, labeling them with mm. this one yeah. uh, attribute, no? like uh, race or uh, sexuality or mm. just because they are male, mm. for example, uh, to, 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 to make this more diverse. How can we do that without labeling them with this one thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
a number, a few solutions. One, One make it paid. EDI work should be paid. Even if it's you're sharing your personal story, if you want people to tell the personal story and use it uh, in your institution for, um, for developing the institution, you should pay people. That's a very simple, <laughs> simple solution to it. Two, make it part of that, what you value in the institution. If you only value uh, uh, publications and grants, nobody's going to sign up because this takes time away from writing grants and doing research. And that's the main reason why when you have any kind of administrative committee or non-paid administrative task, who takes it? Women. Men are really, really good at saying no <laughs> because it takes time away from, from, their, from, their, from their research. And that's the main problem. And it, because it's not paid and it's not valued and we can do all the things we want in the world as long as we don't do those things, it'll never be solved. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm not a very good salesperson, am I? <laughs> have a question there? <laughs> it's really interesting, the discussion. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to, to share a, re a reflection with you to know your opinion because uh, what I have seen the last years with all the quality plan that we have developed in our institution, we have also created alliances between uh, many female scientists and professionals in uh, our science institutions. And there is a moment uh, in which we have a limit uh, that we can't uh, walk uh, so, um, uh, progress because uh, there is, as uh, this woman said, uh, people, well, no, people who take the decisions, men, uh, who are who are not coming and who are not feeling involved in in our transformation uh, process. So, what I see, for example, what happened to me this week and made me reflect a lot was that our director shared with the equality committee of our institution. He's involved in a certain way. At the end, he's the director. He sent um, a, a paper from a conference in which a high level scientist was participating and he did an inspiring, he gave an inspiring talk uh, on his um, um, experience over his life uh, uh, around well, gender in, in science and how in Harvard uh, there were many uh, top uh, level scientists that were feeling really bad in their departments and how he did this like well, work with himself and our director, for the first time, uh, shared with the committee uh, this paper that he found uh, inspiring. And this made me think that maybe we also need uh, some uh, white male heterosexual um, um, uh, deconstructed, uh, uh, inspiring uh, uh, scientist, uh, because when we are trying to well, no, okay, to tell that uh, there are many things that we should change. Sometimes they don't even listen to us, but uh, they find inspiring and they connect with these people. And I don't know what, what is your experience with that, because we have been like inviting uh, many different diverse people to be inspiring to our community, but there is a, there is a group of people who don't uh, feel engaged and that we need to be with us in this, in this process. Thank you. Yeah. I think... Have someone like that is brilliant. Have someone uh, telling how he learned about this and felt inspired and want to change, thing, change things. But it, is, it can be difficult to find these people. And it is difficult to have these conversations sometimes. Uh, also because, as I said, sometimes we become so self-aware of these problems. We had an episode, I, I mentioned the podcast uh, just before. And we had a conversation with a UK university where they were developing their race equality charter. And we talked to the vice dean responsible. And he's a white man. And luckily, and I run this with, and my a white man. So the three men talked, uh, had a nice conversation about how to solve problems about race at UK universities. And just feel, oh, Jesus, they're going to kill me. <laughs> but we had, I think it's a idea that we have to open, the, as I said in the beginning, we have to open these conversations to everybody and we have to have everybody be able to talk about these topics. That's not to say that we should solve the problems, the three men should solve the problems about race, because the main thing that he said was, we need to listen. We need to listen. 
but in a position of power, I have to spend my time listening to people who have some problems, who are experiencing them, and I have to make solutions that actually work. But, but how do... Yeah. <laughs> when you are trying to convince people when you are um, from a minority or like a discriminated uh, group of people, and sometimes uh, I think that they see us like uh, people who victimize themselves. Is, this is not something like uh, personal is political, uh, this is, I think, is, is true, but there is a moment in which people don't connect with you because they, they think that you are complaining all the time. And so mm, there, we need new strategies. That's why I think that uh, having, no like mm, putting people, <laughs> like white people to take decisions about black people, not of course, but people who are in top positions, who are really respected people that, mm, that are able to, to show to others that they, they used to think in a certain way and that they change. I think this is super positive because what I see many times is that now um, men feel like confused and like defensive about these subjects. And so they directly say that, no, no, I, I am super equalitarian, and, but we all know that this is not true. So maybe uh, this is, a, I think, a way uh, that we should explore. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I, I have a question. Uh, maybe it's not really in the core of your presentation, but uh, I would like to go back to the uh, snow clearing yeah. story. Um, because, well, I liked it. It's very nice. Uh, but also I relate with some something, uh, another typical discussion that we have in this uh, uh, working group about uh, um, uh, work balance of, you know, conciliation with family time and so on. So, of course, I think it's great that they detected the problem and they decided to clear the the, the street also for for bikes and for for uh, pedestrians uh, and not just thinking about the car. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a little bit uh, uneasy and comfortable about labeling this as a gender issue because once you do that, it means that you are uh, accepting that the child care is for women and uh, going by car to important meetings is for men. So. Yeah. What's your take on that? I think in the best of all worlds, I agree with you. The problem is we don't live in the best of all worlds. We live in this world. And so sometimes I think the first step is probably to acknowledge how things are. And the, the thing is, and this is abroad, all countries, and Sweden is one of the most equal countries in the world. Perhaps Iceland is the only one more, more equal when also when it comes to this. But no matter where you go, you would see you will see that when it comes to uh, work work done at home is even in Sweden is done by women more than moment. It's like men would have perhaps one or two hours of work at home, women would have, have between three and five. And, and that's how it is. We can, we can say that we sh this shouldn't be an gender issue, but it is. It's just how it is. And the moment we do these things and become aware, aware of them, we can change them. So I do, I, I, in the, yeah, I really want to agree with you that we shouldn't label it as a gender issue, but it is, it, it, it just is. And it's also one of the main problems with when you talk about GDP, et cetera, et cetera. We, we talk about, we, talk about uh, we don't take into account unpaid work and women do the biggest part of un unpaid work globally, even here in Europe. I, I have uh, one comment that reflects a little bit in the place we work. This is a climate change institute mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, diversity and equalities is a big topic also of research. Mm -hmm. So in the Equity Commission, we have uh, a lot of people. We have a lot of young male that have joined because of the topic. It's kind of fun. 
And, and so th this is very positive, but then another reason is because most of us do not get to get decisions at the managerial level. So we kind of play around. So we are playing here in the dark room because it's, we can give opinions, we can have free, we can talk about equality here, but we know that we have absolutely no decision mm -hmm. then of whatsoever happens in the center. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is tricky because on one hand, it gives you this as well, I'm doing something, I'm participating, I feel good about that. But on the other hand, it's masking a very hierarchical system. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I wanted just to, to see how is your vision on that, how to break those barriers or... Um... Well, first of all, representation matters. That's why we need more female uh, uh, vice chancellors or rectors. We need more, much more diverse group. I think it was mm -hmm. is it two or three years ago, uh, St. Andrews in Scotland had a black woman as rector. And it was a huge story. It's like, there's something a bit sad about that. <laughs> also, and, and perhaps worst of all, she was from the humanities. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but still, so that's why, and that is why representation matters. We need both, we need the role models, but we need people to carry this agenda to the top levels. On the other hand, you can also see you could have someone on, to, on, on the highest levels, let's say, make a policy or strategy around these things. And then it's put in the drawer and nothing happens. So taking it there isn't necessarily the solution we want it to be. I actually think sometimes on, on, on floor level, we have more power than we want to, or we ac acknowledge or realize that because we can go into the project because where, where is the real power in the university? Grants, research grants. That's, get a grant and you can more or less get it how we want it. So where, where can you, because we need to change things and we need to change the culture. And you can actually do that from the bottom up because that's where you will have the real chance. Yes, we need to, to take it, have management take it seriously, have a system where harassment can be registered and where it's taken seriously, something is actually done about that. Yes, we definitely need that. But we can also change things on the, in the day-to-day -day way. We can challenge things in the research group we're part of because that's where it really has to change. I mean, vice chancellors will come and go and they, they're not there with you on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes I also think that we could look at and that's why we have taken this very practical approach to our, to our work uh, uh, in the company, is to say, because that's just where it actually happens. So sometimes I, sometimes I yes, you should put, push forward and you should push against, against management and leadership in, in your institution, definitely. But perhaps you could also broaden the discussion to what can, what, what can, what can we actually change in our day-to-day -day work? when we're in a consortia, uh, when we talk about recruitment, how we're training our junior researchers, how we're doing, uh, doing things, because that will change the research culture. And that's what really has to change. I like, that's one of the things like that, we, that we're moving from talking about research integrity and talking more broadly about research culture, because basically it's a culture that's broken. We have time for a couple more questions. Here, Anna. Mm -hmm. Since that was nice and also for raising the importance of the intersectionality approach. Um, I, I think that one of the key aspects that why we are not reaching this diversity in academia is because of the re research assessment that you were talking before. Um, I, I, I suppose that you know about the DORA assessment. And I would like to know your, your thoughts or if you had had any examples of good practices, because I mean, it's really easy to join. Everybody joins Dora, yeah. but then how you apply and, and when you are doing job offers or I mean, which, which are your feelings and how the implementation of, of Dora is, is, is being in the research centers? 
I have mixed feelings about it. I think there are some people who take it very seriously and work with it. The main examples I've seen were in the UK, and unfortunately there you have also seen some very horrible examples of universities who have signed DORA, and then at the end of the day, where they had to uh, fire some people, what did they do? They took the people and they ranked them according to bibliometrics and according to how many grants they had. And then they had to fire 10. So they took the 10 people in the bottom. That's not very Dora. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not any, anything good. Uh, but this, the, this university has actually signed uh, Dora. And it wasn't until some people actually said, well, hey, can you do that? And alerted Dora about this. And can can what what can we actually do about this? Can we take this? Can can we take the signature away? Can we tell them that they're not part of this anymore? And I think that's probably I think that's going to happen more and more that we will actually not necessarily not only look at the good exams because I think most universities are at least trying to some extent. But what I would really like to see is the shaming of the people who said they signed Dora and don't uh, work with it. And I, I, I mean, that's the only way forward. Unfortunately, I think in this business is the only way forward when it comes to something like Dora is public, is public shaming because it's so easy to, to sign it and not do anything and nothing will happen. But when they do something wrong, then hit hard and shame them and say, well, you're not actually part of this. And they don't really, I mean, a lot of, and I'm really, <laughs> I'm really bashing on university management today. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm you're a bit a bit of a target here, don't I? <laughs> but I think some of it also come. I mean, it doesn't really matter because what matters is rankings. And as long as we have the rankings, they won't give a shit about Dora. <laughs> yeah, and th the moment that this is included, that they change the rankings and how they the rankings are built and it will benefit them to work with Dora and have a research assessment in, in, a, in, a, in a decent way, then you will see an explosion in, in, in universities working constructively and implementing this. Look for some, look towards some uh, Loughborough in the UK. They have Elizabeth Gad, Elizabeth Gad. She's incredibly, everybody should follow Elizabeth Gad on Twitter. Uh, no, but she's really, really good with bibliometrics. And she's also part of the iNorms group who's working with rankings, et cetera, et cetera. And she's at Loughborough. And I think they have done some, some brilliant work because of her. And she's really big on, on research culture. And I think she would, do, she would definitely be one who could follow her. And you can see some more about some people who are doing great stuff. Elizabeth Gad. No, I, I will end it, if you let me, with a quote. Um, yesterday, I got an email from a, a white uh, CIS hetero uh, group leader uh, here at the Institute with a very nice uh, paper on diversity on physics, which is one of our main um, topics at the Institute. And uh, it's from, uh, it, it, it quoted also a paper from Anne Nelson, who was a very good physics. And uh, at the end it said, if your career is established and you are not making an explicit and continual effort to encourage, mentor and support all young physicists to create a, wel a welcoming climate in your department and to promote the hiring of the diverse faculty members, you are part of a problem. This is a critical issue in civil rights in your job. So I think this is uh, like a very good summary of what we are trying to do here. Maybe we are not very established, all of us, in our positions, but uh, we are trying to do something. So well done. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, Yes, a quick and applause. Yeah, that please. We have uh, a coffee. Uh
exiting uh, the corridor and on the right is on the outside, but uh, I hope we will not be burned there. <laughs> and, and afterward, we will have the first um, parallel uh, discussions. So uh, is on the communication uh, topic. Uh, and uh, here you have the, the list of the people uh, expecting to be standing in every room. Uh, the main one, the first one is this one. And after in the first floor, uh, we have a meeting room like uh, in front of this on the first floor and on the second floor in the same place. So uh, we can take, uh, you can take yourself uh, to find where you must go. And <clears throat> we will end all the sessions like five, 10 minutes before uh, the time because we need to change the room. But this is then for us to be able to discuss with the most people as possible. And we will have the wrap up after all the sessions here. And sorry, we will have the first table and then the lunch and afterwards the other two. Okay. Thank Perfect. Much. Thank you. I think three, four minutes per reporter would be enough, but I think that we are not here because I, I received some by email. So, um, but the aim uh, of the reporters is mostly if we are able to collect all the reports and create like a small group of people to uh, write a whole document with all the conclusions, thoughts, that were raised during the, the tables and being able to share it with all the SOMA community, not only the one we, that were here, but also with other centers. And also this uh, wrap up is being recorded by our communication team, so we can share it with the community too. So the reporters of the first session on the communication actions, who they are, so, Neus, can you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, okay. discussion group was about the effective communication option the plans and action and in most of the cases uh, people working in the communication department uh, they are basically in charge of uh, the communication oh, yeah the communication and dissemination of uh, the gender equity plan and so we stress the importance of reaching out not only members of the institute but also members of the university and of the soma alliance so it will be nice to have a sort of repository of all the jobs in maybe next year or when all the people uh, will get uh, their jobs completed and so the second question was about, uh, is all, uh, your organization aware of the existence of the gender equity plan? And in most of the cases, yes. And the actions so some of our centers um, have uh, the second or third edition of the JEP and some other just the first one. So maybe next year we can go on with the discussion. And uh, so if uh, the gender equity plan is included in the communication plan, and in this case, uh, in most of the cases, it's included, and there are like different means of communicating the gender equity policies. And for example, just few examples are uh, the newsletters that can be on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis or monthly basis, uh, the website, 
or a dedicated uh, web page of the institute. And uh, other means are social networks such as Twitter, because most of uh, the people are using Twitter and or other platform. Uh, so one of the suggestions was to use uh, screens and televisions in the research institute just to uh, attract visually all the people passing by just to catch the attention on the uh, gender equity policy. And another, use uh, the screen, okay. And another good example uh, is to involve uh, group leaders and the director of the center to promote the gender equity policy. So in most of the cases, uh, the policies were signed by the director, but it's also true that uh, if group leaders can inform uh, their, the member of their groups, we can increase the awareness about uh, gender equity in our institutes. So that's my note. I don't know, I don't know if would like to add some other information. Thank you. Oops, oops, oops. Thank you. Okay, so um, our group started a discussion on communication and sort of navigated to other waters. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll try. I'll try to wrap up. Um, those conclusions that that had uh, that that have to do with communication, um, it was um, clear that not all the centers were at the same level or in the same moment, and um, some centers had a, a lot or some things done. Others were just starting. And in this sense, and this is something that I've seen in other discussions, um, maybe uh, SOMA could help. Uh, it would be a good, a good um, um, action that uh, SOMA could somehow centralize or help coordinate or create a series of guidelines or checklists or call it whatever in, in different aspects. Um, it's important, uh, the internal discussion is important, not, there wasn't uh, an equal awareness in all centers of the equal ops plan or, or the uh, gender actions. So um, we saw some examples of how this internal discussion could, uh, or dissemination could take place. Um, most uh, institute well most or all institutions do have a gender plan but uh, usually it's um, somewhere in the web hard to find and um, this is not enough <laughs> so um, we saw some some examples of of uh, gender actions and how they are uh, how they were communicated um, it was clear that um, the more uh, the actions are communicated towards the the outside, the higher impact they, they have on the on the women in this case that that were um, uh, granted uh, the award or the recognition. Um, it was also discussed how important it is to to monitor the impact, the real impact of this uh, of these uh, actions. And um, maybe again, we could help each other understanding how this impact can be measured, how can it be monitored? Um, and that's it, because then we went into a discussion that has nothing to do with <laughs> communication. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, I, I just realized that maybe we are making a video and, and you're talking, you know, from your back. So I will ask the next ones to, to come there and, and then they will be at most, <laughs> at least they will be visible for the, for the camera. So uh, the second part was on the, the second uh, topic was on the gender plans, um, uh, how to make it uh, more efficient. Is a new reporter here because I was one, but you too? Okay, come. Yeah, please. 
computer because I have the notes in the computer. Yeah, sure. Okay, very briefly. So we were. Okay. Yeah. yeah so we were. We asked uh, how many centers they had um, at the end of the quality plan before 2021 when they become obligatory. And there were four centers that um, among the ones that were in the, in the session that had um, a gender plan. A, this one, which if I understood correctly, they are working now in the third one, right? Uh, the University of Barcelona, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the computing center, a computing center near in the area. I don't know the name. What? Is, what? Uh, the computer vision center. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, which is um, which is also uh, working on on the on the gender plan. I have uh, a gender plan, and uh, so we basically uh, try to find ways to or to see examples of implementation of the gender plan. And uh, there were a few because it's not always easy to to apply uh, measures the for example, related to salary things. That, so it's not always easy because you don't have this freedom to adjust the salaries. And uh, so this will be the, the most, you can monitor if the salaries are the same or not, any deviation. But for example, in the case of the university institutes where the salaries are fixed at the level of the postdoc, PhD, more or less, or, or any permanent position, I mean, you don't have anything to monitor there, if it's the deviation of the salary between women and men, for example, female and men. But for other centers, the, you can implement tools to monitor that. And um, another thing that we talked about was uh, and how to uh, implement um, uh, measures related to inclusive, the use of inclusive language when you have an offer, a job offer. So we shared some tools. Uh, some web pages where you can just put your uh, announcement for a position and then you can check if the language you are using is appropriate or not. So we decided to put some information on, on what are the tools that we are using and to make it available. So maybe in some in the Google Docs that we have or Drive or whatever. And um, what else? Oh, yeah. So in order to make the gender part uh, or the measures or the actions that we implement aware to the other people, then the issues we talk about something I learned today that the figure of the scientific influencer that I didn't know. So people who are really play a relevant role in, uh, in science, for example, you, in all the institutes we have these figures that they are very active in, in all these outreach activities. So they are very important no? because they have prices and things like that. They can use social media in order to make aware the other people no? of the activities that we, we are doing uh, as implementation of the gender plan. And what else? Um, mm. Yeah, we expose some particular cases where we uh, specific locate some funds for female students in areas where there is a deficit of, of female students. So we talk about this implementation on, on the experience, which was very positive. So, um, for example, in our institute where we actually uh, could get some women uh, specific funds look, uh, for women that uh, finish uh, the master and they were waiting to the, uh, to the um, fellowship for doing the PhD. So in order to keep these women, these female uh, researchers in, uh, in the Institute, we locate some specific funds for these people. And oh, actually we look, look at some funds and we gave some a specific puntuation, uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, one point over 10 or whatever, in order to make uh, some kind of positive discrimination, okay, in this kind of funds on this one of the measures that were presented. And uh, another thing was we uh, talk about how uh, to um, uh, balance the committees that uh, at the end have to judge or have to um, yeah, be in the panel of the recruitment panel of postdoc positions and 
PhD students, for example, a fellowship that you can uh, give with the Maria MIS2 or, or some of the funds that we have. This was the measure that we were sharing. Uh, I don't know if there is any other reporter from the gender plan too. It's you again. Oh yes, because we missed Nadia. Yeah, sure. Sorry. So more or less, um, we discussed about the similar topics, and just uh, to highlight that most of the research centers they they do have to use um, general the gender equity plans from the universities or from uh, CSIC and then adapt it to their own institute. So. Most of the center do not have their own gender equity plan. And so, no, no, no. So we have discussed in in few groups that maybe um, for the future implementation, uh, it's worth uh, plan thinking about uh, the transition from the gender issue to the diversity issue. So it's not only gender equity, but also uh, intersectionality. So maybe it's a discussion for next year. Uh, regarding the actions, uh, we got some comments uh, regarding the, uh, the idea that the gender equity policy uh, studied such as a bureaucratic document, it was compulsory to get like European projects or to get uh, the uh, HR for our if I'm not wrong, uh, recognition. Uh, but anyway, uh, even if it's only a bureaucratic document, uh, it's just a possibility to improve stuff in their own institute. Another thing that was discussing about the, this positive deviation was that if it's necessary, the positive deviation that some people are not agree with that. So and um, we talk about that, the, that the, in, instead of include a positive deviation will be to, um, to create the right questions and, and the right profiles in, in everything. For example, if you include, for example, that one um, position will be, a, or, or one a workshop or one a seminar will be held in, a, in a Friday from a six to 10 o'clock at night. Of course, you are including there some kind of bias because most some of women cannot be there because have another things to do or to achieve. So the right questions in the right place will be will we do uh, a lot of work for 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 this these kind of things. So and we discuss a lot about this diversity and inclusion. It's not binary. It should not be binary. It should be more uh, diverse. <laughs> so and I think I don't know if somebody wants to include something else about this no in our group no, more or less. ah and one one recommendation about one one movie uh, ah, picture of scientists uh, yes. <laughs> um well the 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 representative of the of the group we see that not many of them of, of us uh, of the components of the group uh, had a mentoring program. Some of some of, uh, of us, yes, we have. So because I see, for example, that there was in the UAB a mentoring program, but it's not exclusive for women, for women. It was for PhD and postdocs. We also see that, uh, for example, BSC uh, have the in the life science department a mentoring program and exclusive for women is a pilot and only for women. And they are starting. Uh, and we have discussed in that maybe it not uh, inclusive and some regarding that, no? some, some questions about that. The other centers, uh, in fact, they don't have a mentoring program that they are interested in to have it. Uh, what I see into is now with two mentoring programs, the internal mentoring program and also the mentoring program that is developing in together with PIST. For example, I see CRG, ICFO, uh, IRB, IFI, and ICT is doing uh, now. And the idea that is uh, has been discussing also is that maybe 
uh, mentoring program that is composed by several centers or, or a big umbrella is maybe better for the opportunities to share uh, the options, no? The option to do to, to pairs and to be effective. Uh, it's one idea that's maybe have been consolidated in the, in the group. Um, it's important to detect what is the goal of the mentoring program, can be career development, can be also exclusive for women in order to uh, develop the career. So it's important that when the mentor and the mentee finds and the mentee choose one mentor is what is the proposal, no? the, the goal of this mentorship, because maybe one mentor can help in professional development, but not can help in, in terms of gender. No? So it's important to, to take it in account. Um, one other question that one other thing that we have discussed uh, uh, is about the, um, that the mentoring program is school. It's a thing very interesting no? for, for, for everybody, but also need many times of management. So mentoring program, um, uh, uh, for example, the matching is, is the key of the program. So it's one of the more best, uh, most important thing of the program. But also the management that there, there are some reports, some monitoring of, of how it's work, some trainings. Uh, also, we have talked that it's important to train the mentor and the mentee in how a mentoring program works. So it's important also this, this work and this organization. Um, also, have, there are some, some comments about, for example, that uh, some several mentoring program that is working now, for example, for the Sociedad Española de Astrofísica. Also, they are the Rebecca program that is organize, organized by FECIT, uh, is beyond academia, and that was launched two years ago, and it's a transversal and umbrella that some of the research centers in Spain can, can participate. Also, there are some other mentoring programs at the Asociación de Científicos Retornados a España. Uh, some very recently, now this week, we have received some information about the Unidad de Mujeres en Ciencia that is developing also a mentoring program. So, well, so there are options, not just for to do here uh, in, in, the, in your center, but also to do in together with, with, other, with other centers. No? Uh, another thing that is important also, and we have seen that is also a good manner to promote similar things like the mentoring program is the events of networking, because we, we consider that networking events can help also to, to, to find another pair, no? to find some person that can help you in, in, in something. So it's just also to, to have in mind to prepare this with some topic maybe, but to prepare this kind of discussion, maybe today is a, can be a good example no? that can share things and can um, help and, and learn from others. Um, so for example, one of the members that was participating said that in the computer science uh, is in, in many countries in the United States, the networking events is very useful. So, and it's a very good uh, matter to promote knowledge. Um, and another thing uh, that to take an account is the anonymous. No? It's, we don't think we'll have discussing at the, at the end of the meeting, that how to take care about the anonymous of the people that is participating because it not created some uh, bad feelings or bad situation. So it's a thing to take in account and, and take care to that the person that is participating has the possibility to be anonymous, no? to be, with uh, less information as possible. Um, also, one other idea that was uh, in the meeting and in the, in the session was about to detect in the organization who is, for example, a good contact for diversity things, for harassment things. So to have some identified person in, the, in your organization to treat, to, uh, talk about this kind of things. If you, if some one of the organizations has this problem, how to go to see this, this person. No? And important to train the mentors, to train the mentees, to have clear the protocols before to start, protect the animals. So this is more or less the, 
no me digas, sí. Sí. Okay. Thanks. So, we have the last one. Hi. <laughs> So uh, regarding our, our working group uh, for, the, for the questions, uh, does your organization have a mentoring program if yes, is only your organization members is available? Yeah, so uh, there were uh, a diversity of, uh, of options. So in our case, we have a uh, mentoring program, but in other cases, they don't have the mentoring program yet. So in one case, uh, in some cases, the mentoring program is an uh, internal mentoring program, but in other cases, it's external. So um, basically, they were diversity of options, and, and I think that we learn quite a lot one from the, the others, the different possibilities, and indeed, we have to action now. <laughs> so uh, what else? It is successful. How many people is participating? Um, the mentoring program, I think that in uh, none of the cases, it was only for women. Just in one case, it appears, I think it was ICQ at the University of Barcelona. Yeah, you told it appeared during the pandemic situation, and it was a spontaneous formation of a mentoring group. And finally, it, it evolved into a, into a mentoring group initially designed, or, or let's say that participated by women, but at the end, at nowadays, if I understood it correctly, nowadays it's a, it's a mentoring program established inside the, the Maria Maezzo, I think you are Maria Maezzo Center, and is a, is a mentoring program which is uh, well-defined and well-stated, including both males and, and females. It was extended to uh, men, uh, finally. Uh, what else? So, uh, we were talking also on the impact of the mentoring program on the males and females, women and men that they are involved. Uh, and I think that from ES Global, you, I think that you did some research on it, and it seems that the impact of the mentoring program in uh, women is, let's say, more, in, not, I would not say important, but I would say more impact than in male regarding two different things. One, it was um, that it helps to, uh, to, to some go, go beyond the different challenge than uh, women it, we, we find during our uh, daily work. And secondly, because it, it's uh, self-confidence, so it provides us self-confidence, and this is something that it can be exploited to think and to define uh, uh, the new mentoring program in the centers that haven't yet, or they are going to think about a new mentoring program. In this uh, regard, we were also talking on the indicators, how important they are. Uh, in order to define and to understand, so which are the, the public of these mentoring programs, both mentee and, and, and mentor. And also, uh, we also point out the different challenge, which are different from males and females regarding the, the, the mentoring programs that we want to define. And then there were two different things. So the importance of the formation that uh, the, the mentor and the, not only the mentee, but basically the mentor, uh, one should have. And in this regard, they appear two different actions that we have also action leaders. <laughs> one is, the, one is uh, to, to somehow collect all of the information of the centers, of the, of the some, uh, some alliance centers, to share uh, between us all the information on the formation that we are providing because it seems to be, it seems that it's somehow important for the new, uh, for the centers that you are working on the new mentoring program to have information on the formation, on the, on the companies or, or different agents, different people that is able to provide uh, some uh, career development or training. And, and one idea, it was to collect all of this information in a Google Drive that the, that the website uh, it contains in order to share it. And I think that you, <laughs> we have also, an, uh, Agatha, <laughs> I think that, I think that uh, well, what you suggest is that we need an action plus an action leader, otherwise it's very difficult to deal with. <laughs> and we have the action and the action leader. And the second point, which is important, that I think that uh, 
you pointed out, it was the possibility to provide some training of the centers that we already have a mentoring program to the ones that they want to implement the mentoring program because it, it could be some important information that we can share and, uh, and they say that all the troubles and all the difficult and all the questions that uh, in our case is cool, you know, all the questions that we had, that how explain it to a short, uh, we we're talking about a workshop on mentoring uh, for, for the group, uh, for the working group of, uh, of gender. And uh, you also wanted an action leader and we have an action leader. So <laughs> uh, and the idea is to that two, three, four, research center that they have a mentoring program, they would be able to share the, the know-how and the difficulties associated to the mentoring program to the newcomers in, in, this, in this area. And I think that more or less this is, uh, well, I mean, we also discussed about different things that they were not directly related on the mentoring program that I think that uh, they, they are not, uh, well, it's not necessary to go through. And, uh, and I think that that's all. I don't know if I am forgetting something. Fine. So um, that's all from my side. Okay. <laughs> okay. So perfect. I think we are. We have come to the end of the the event. Um, I am. I was remembering the meeting we had to to decide how to do this uh, today's event, uh, and we wanted to talk, and we wanted to share, and we wanted to discuss and uh, and being able to to provide a place where everybody can participate actively to the event i hope it was the case we try to to offer you the maximum space possible and uh, the time um, even if a friday afternoon is not that easy but um I just wanted to thank to all of you for participating, to my colleagues at IC and Truth and the communication team to make it uh, possible. And also uh, to the reporters, because I will contact you and try to, to do this, uh, I don't know, maybe Google Docs or whatever, to wrap up in a single document all the thoughts that were shared today and uh, make it available to the summer community. So thank you very much for all of you. And yes, that's all. All the work. <laughs> so thank you very much, Nuria. Thanks. Thank and that's all. It was a pleasure. And personally, I enjoyed very, very much. I jump into the, <laughs> the gender questions, uh, problems, commissions, plans. And I think that hopefully we see one to each other very, 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 very soon. Thank you very much to be here. Thank you. Thank you.